the problem was ever since Roe, the, 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 game, the game has been rigged in favor of the pro-abortion clause. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court has not allowed democracy to operate here. So, uh, hello and welcome, Dr. Carlson, to this second podcast we are recording together. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you once again. We already had the privilege uh, to have you on our program, on our podcast, talking about family issues just about three months ago. It was a fascinating talk with you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Quite a lot of things have happened in between. Uh, by the way, in Switzerland politics, we kind of lost the uh, gay marriage issue. So that we had a we had the, the people of Switzerland deciding we will have same sex marriages in the future. But we are uh, in a good mood and looking forward for uh, what kind of things will come. Now today, I would like to talk to you about. Uh, the theme of abortion and birth control. Um, we just had a, there's just been a hearing in the US uh, Supreme Court, I hear, yesterday concerning the uh, abortion issues, which uh, might be a challenge to Roe versus Wade, which uh, was the big decision in 1973. So I'm sure we will have an occasion to talk about these, uh, these things. Did you have uh, time to uh, to listen to the oral arguments, or did you hear anything about the what happened yesterday? I heard part of it, and then I've also been reading uh, kind of transcripts of what happened and read a few commentators. So I think I have a pretty good sense of what happened yesterday. Great. So uh, maybe maybe we should go back to to Roe versus Wade, which is this kind of big court case that uh, legalized, basically legalized abortion uh, almost 50 years ago. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about that court case. What was it about? Uh, maybe how, how did the decision affect the US in the years afterwards? Uh, what was the impact of this Roe versus Wade decision? Uh -huh. I'm a, I'm a historian, so I, I actually would have pushed you back even further, about 120 years, just to oh, give it a, a pure context. Prior to 1850, um, abortion was illegal in most of the states and territories of the United States, but uh, no one was quite sure, uh, didn't know a whole lot about fetal development. And so in most cases, prior to what was called quickening, abortion was practiced and rarely prosecuted. Now, quickening uh, is that moment when a mother for the first time feels the baby moving inside of her. Uh, it's generally at about five, four to five months is when there's physical signs that the mother and others can see that the baby's inside and alive. Uh, so it's, it has nothing to do actually with fetal development. It only has to do with perception uh, prior to, uh, prior to, to, to medical uh, uh, indications. Um, well, anyway, abortion was again practiced in the United States, uh, not widely, uh, always somewhat on the dark side, but was still happening up to about 1850. At that time, a physician by the name of Horatio Storer, S T O R E R, who taught uh, midwifery and obstetrics, uh, women's medicine at Harvard University, um, uh, began to write on new findings in fetology on the nature of the fetus and was able to argue that the fetus was alive and moving and growing much earlier. Uh, that in fact, it was a distinct, a distinct living entity. And to make a long story short, he started what became known as the, the doctor's crusade against abortion. Most of the abortions being, occurring were being practiced done by midwives, women who delivered babies, but also on the side would do abortions too. Uh, now it's not all midwives, but some clearly were doing that. And so this was a crusade by medical doctors against that practice. And by 1860, the American Medical Association, the main medical doctors group, 
uh, agreed with Storr. And uh, starting in 1860 until about 1880, every state uh, in the United States and all of the territories under the federal government uh, put a ban, a complete ban on, on abortion, uh, except to save the life of a mother. And um, that's where that was sets of laws came from. They were they were strong. Uh, they were uh, they were enforced by and large for a long time. Then along came the abortion reform movement of the 1960s. We're jumping ahead a century, yeah. and we'll probably come back to where that came from. But uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, challenges to attacks on the legal framework of of, 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 of abortion regulation began to take place. And churches got involved too. We'll probably come back to that as well a little bit later. But then along came the decision Roe v. Wade, which was 1973. You had a question? No, it's good. Uh, it came in 19, uh, the decision was issued uh, January of 1973. And it was a startling and stunning decision because it overturned the laws of all 50 states. Every state, uh, had either still a ban on abortion or a regulated abortion uh, to, to one degree or another. A few states like New York had, had liberalized abortion. It was fairly easy to get one there. But most states still, uh, again, had a ban or almost a complete ban. Roe v. Wade threw that out completely. Um, it was a radical act of judicial activism. Um, what it did is it took a concept called the right to privacy which is not in the U.S. Constitution, uh, but the justices argued that it was implicit or implied or in the aura or penumbra of the Bill of Rights was the phrase they used. What that, is that? It, <laughs> well, it's sort of the glow, the halo of the Bill of Rights. Uh, there are some, one of the, for example, one of the, uh, one of our Bill of Rights, the first 10th Amendment of our Constitution says, you know, there's, uh, no unreasonable searches and seizures and things like that. You can't enter someone's home, basically, and just start taking stuff. So it implies a right to at least personal privacy, some autonomy. But the word privacy doesn't exist in the Constitution. But the, in 1965, this was eight years earlier, uh, the issue was birth control, and the, the regulation of birth control. <laughs> One of the last strong laws in the United States against birth control, uh, its sale and distribution was in Connecticut. And the case was called the Griswold yes. case. And uh, the court ruled then that, uh, the, uh, that married couples had a constitutional right to use birth control. Um, that's really what it boiled down to. And they used this concept of privacy there. So that's where the privacy right first appeared. It was used then by the justices in Roe v. Wade in 1973 to throw out all the laws, all of the anti-abortion laws. Um, it's sort of something fairly unprecedented in American jurisprudence to see such a sweeping act. Because such matters had been seen as places that's for the states to decide, not for the federal government or the federal courts. Mm -hmm. So a row we way through that out, what the court put in place was a very awkward system called of trimesters, three trimesters. For the first three months of a pregnancy, <clears throat> the states could do nothing to limit a woman's right and access to an abortion. For the second three months, uh, the state had some interest and they could do some regulation, maybe, although it's never clear what that was or what the limits were. Mm -hmm. And then the third trimester, the state had a fairly strong interest in protect, prevent, and protecting infant, infant or at least pre-born infant life, or at least some interest, and maybe could prohibit it then. Mm -hmm. The trimester system uh, didn't work very well, and it was replaced basically with another court case, the Casey decision, uh, 1992, if I remember correctly, which threw out the uh, trimester system by large, replaced it with the test of uh, survivability or the ability of a, of, of a child to, to survive outside the mother, yes. and uh, yes. outside the mother's womb. And that became the, uh, the new test, the new standard of uh, whether 
a state could regulate abortion up to viability or survivability. Uh, prior to that, the state could not limit abortion uh, in any meaningful way. After the stage of viability, which ten, back then was 28 weeks, uh, generally it's now down to about 22 to 23 weeks or even earlier in some cases. After that, the state can regulate and or even ban uh, abortion. Um, so that's what happened in the Casey decision. What's happening now, what happened in this case yesterday, this case from uh, Missouri, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson is the uh, legal name uh, of the case. State of Mississippi um, uh, passed a law which banned abortion after the 15th week of pregnancy. Now, it's been a direct rejection of the concept of viability because no viability standard reaches to 15 weeks. Some get close to 20, maybe or 22 weeks, but not 15. So it's a direct challenge to the framework of the abortion decision in AC. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of peculiarities to the case. We, it's not important to get into those. Only to say this: that if this, if the law, if this law is upheld by the Supreme Court, uh, whatever the reason or rationale they use, and they could take a number of different approaches, it does represent. It would represent the overturning of the Roe slash Casey line of cases. Um, they could they could overturn it on, a, on technical matters. They could overturn it with a sweeping decision, just basically repudiating the whole logic of Roe and Casey. Uh, either way, the end result is the viability standard falls. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's unclear what <laughs> what will take its place. Uh, uh, apparently, yesterday. Judging again from court watchers, people who make a living trying to figure out how the justices are thinking by the kind of questions they ask or the smirks they have or the smiles or the frowns. Uh, the six conservative justices on the court, all of them seem to be leaning towards uh, approving the Mississippi law one way or another. Uh, that's quite surprising. It would be a, a dramatic shift or a dramatic change. So it, things, the, the decision will probably not be released until this next June. Uh, it's going to be a lot of wrenching of hands and a lot of, mm -hmm. oh, the, the, the world is coming to an end sort of thing from the pro-abortion side. We'll see what happens. Um, and sometimes the court just surprises people and doesn't do what, what you think they're going to do. But this, in this case, probably for the first time, the overturn of Roe v. Wade, either softly or with with firm uh, with firm decision, is going to happen. Thank you. It's interesting to see uh, 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 first insight into what's happening in the U.S. Um, so uh, maybe we could go back to Roe versus Wade because I think that's a very interesting story. I would like to get a bit more of a feel about what happened there and, uh, you know, who are the players, what was the general social mood, why, why did Roe versus Wade happen, you know? Can, can you give us some ideas there? Well, it was a convergence of, I think, several, uh, of, of several developments. Um, I think some of which I've seen you write about as well. Uh, I think the... The first one was a, a sense that um, a sexual revolution was taking place. Um, and it was, in a way. Uh, some of the, the uh, uh, it began actually on the issue of birth control. Uh, the uh, American laws against birth control, like American laws against abortion, were refined and sharpened and strengthened back in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, specifically uh, under the influence of a man named Anthony Comstock. They were called the Comstock Laws. He was an evangelical Christian. Uh, he <clears throat> created, he guided a committee that was originally created by the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, um, 
They created a committee in New York State called the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. Uh, and these were evangelical Christians, not Catholics, uh, mm -hmm. but their, their, their guiding argument, the guiding assumption was that abortion, birth control, and pornography were all different aspects of the same problem. And Anthony Comstock was able to, uh, backed by some very prominent and influential people, most of the business leaders of the time, for example, if you can imagine, uh, the, the major business leaders were backing him financially and otherwise, and politically, uh, was able to win a, a federal law which prohibited the distribution through the mail which at the time was the main way of getting things around. There, there was no internet, so there were, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. anything that would uh, would either information or devices that would uh, would uh, affect birth control, abortifacients, that is, uh, items, potions, and devices that would uh, allow for an abortion, which would make an abortion happen, or a pornography also, and was so remarkably successful in suppressing these things. State laws, uh, again, influenced by the Comstock uh, argument, uh, prohibited the sale um, and distribution of birth control devices and also abortifacients. And from oh, about 1875 until about 1925, this whole legal regime was strong and, and uh, and and worked um, quite well, and, and given its given its assumptions, it started to fall apart in the 1920s. Again, this was after the Great War, after World War One, which shook a lot of moral certainties, not just in Europe but also in America. Uh, Anthony Comstock died. The people that re the people that replaced him were not as I guess strong. Were not as committed. Uh, Christian churches, starting with the Anglicans, with the Episcopalians, started to waver on birth control and began to accept arguments or start to listen to arguments that uh, that too many troubled pregnancies uh, were happening. Women were uh, being forced to carry births, I mean, carry babies. Uh, to the detriment of their health, mental and physical. And uh, the consensus, the Christian consensus against birth control and abortion began to break down. Uh, formally in 1930 with the Lambeth decision uh, by the Anglicans that year. But other American churches, not so much the evangelical churches at this point, but we, we call the mainline churches, the uh, uh, Protestant churches started to soften on the birth control question. And so when that, that over the next several decades, that, that influence the, the Christian decision, uh, the Christian, uh, Christian churches, many of them started to turn to favor birth control. They would always say not abortion, no, they're, they're different things, but we, we feel that birth control should be legalized at first just for married people, but that, distinction didn't last very long, uh, either culturally or legally. So that's how the thing started to fall apart. Um, and uh, so the birth control question led to the abortion question. That's maybe the first thing to say. Um, the, uh, well, um, can, you, can you tell me uh, how, what, what was the, the connection? How, how did the birth control question lend to the abortion issue? Just because it's like a continuation, or the uh, go back to back to the framework of the American laws of the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. They were seen as three as pornography, birth control, and abortion were seen as three aspects of the same problem. Okay, a okay. breakdown of the Christian understanding of sex, marriage, and family. Like another way to put it, and I think that's true. Mm -hmm. The Christian understanding. Uh, uh, which goes back not just centuries, but millennia, uh, back to the church fathers of the second, third, and fourth centuries. Pretty much, you can summarize it pretty simply. Uh, it's uh, 
within marriage, fidelity, uh, outside of marriage, chastity. Uh, and that's pretty simple, but that's there's, there's nuances here and there, but that's pretty much the way it works. And that sexuality is confined to marriage. Uh, the sexual relationship, it's, it, it, it has two primary purposes. Uh, one is procreation, the other is uh, to build a home, a, a relationship, to create a one flesh union of man and woman. That's the Christian understanding. Um, birth control, contraception, and abortion all attack that understanding. I guess that may be the way to say how how okay. that is how okay. that would be see them pulled together. Would you say that the birth uh, possibility of birth control that that kind of opened the door for for uh, for uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage? Or of course. Particularly, again, the early early decisions and changing this, both did I say both the arguments of the churches, but also in the courts. Okay, birth control is good for for married couples, but mm -hmm. unmarried people can't use it. Well, that distinction didn't last more than five years. Uh, mm -hmm. You open the door, uh, mm -hmm. changes inevitably followed. And I'm speaking now not as a moralist or as a Christian. I'm just speaking as an historian. Once you open the door on the birth control issue. Um, the abortion question kept rearing up in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, many Christians to this day still want to say abortion bad, or, but birth control is good. Yes. But draw, yes. once you open the door, it's hard to draw. The lines get harder and harder to draw. And I mean, human beings being by nature looking for the easy way out will find the easy way out but that i mean that would be basically the evangelical position more or less birth control yes abortion no that's how i kind of grew up in my you know uh, that was my view of things uh, growing up and marrying and you know having a family I think, well, it's by far the dominant view around certainly the developed world today, without question. Okay. That is. that is. It doesn't mean that you can draw the line or the law hold, the line, hill, line mm -hmm. holds. Mm -hmm. uh, I think historically, uh, again, you, the lines start falling apart and breaking down. And that even happened among evangelicals. I imagine we'll talk about that maybe okay. a little later. Yeah. So I... I uh... I, I came across, across a few figures uh, doing my research, and one of the figures was a, a guy called uh, Larry Ladder or Lawrence Ladder. Uh, he seems to have written a very influential book in the whole uh, build up to the legalization of abortion, and also uh, 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 that uh, feminism had a certain role or kind of jumped on board of the abortion issue at a certain stage. And uh, I also discovered some uh, theologians, some pastors, kind of uh, trying to advocate for abortion very actively. Uh, do you know these per uh, these persons and these issues? Can you give us some more, you know, some some information there? Well, certainly, uh, I think that beyond the sexual revolution, beyond the birth control challenge. Uh, the, 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 the forces of feminism and concern over overpopulation, I think, were the two driving, other two driving main forces. Mm -hmm. And certainly in feminism, uh, uh, the feminist movement began to gain steam beyond, beyond the question just of the votes for women. In the United States, that sort of peaked in the, around during the, world, during the First World War uh, with the uh, amendment to the Constitution allowing women to vote. After that, feminism uh, one group was quite happy. That's all they wanted. Mm -hmm. Another group said, no, that's just the first step. Uh, feminism was strong in the United States in the 1920s and early 30s. And the Depression and war, World War II came along. Uh, feminism uh, went to an eclipse. And then after World War II the, in the United States, we had the marriage boom and the baby boom. Um, quite unexpected things. And again, feminism... Uh, almost disappeared as a, certainly as a significant cultural and political movement until about 
19, the early 1960s. And the name Betty Friedan comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, she wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique, which adapted ideas you know, uh, circulating in Europe, uh, books by Simone de Beauvoir yeah, and, and, and others. But she trans, <laughs> yeah, yes, okay, there, there's her book. And, you know, the book, the book is an interesting book. It's, uh, on the one hand, she got some things right. Uh, one thing she got right was the, I talked about the marriage boom and the baby boom. Mm -hmm. It was also the era of the housewife in the, in, in the United States. And most American women, pretty educated American women, became housewives. Uh, and, uh, and became mothers of you know, three, four, or five children. Again, birth, the, birth, the birth rate went up. It didn't go back to uh, what I'll call uh, the standards of the 19th and 18th centuries when eight or nine children per family were pretty common, but it went back up. Mm -hmm. But the make a long story short, the suburban housewife model had a lot of problems and Betty Friedan zeroed in on them. Mm -hmm. uh, American housing patterns in the suburbs were not well designed to support community there. They had a far too radical of a separation from, of the place you live, from the place you work, and the place you shop. I mean, European villages are much better mm -hmm. uh, than American suburbs and cities, how they became. Uh, the uh, home was stripped of all real functions. Uh, they were either taken over by the government or by, in a sense, by, by, by the corporate sector, by, mm -hmm. by, by selling things. People stopped doing things, making things in their home. The home had been the center of education, no longer. Kids went off to school. Uh, even, even cooking was discouraged. You were supposed to get your food out of cans and TV dinners and frozen TV dinners. And it is true that the housewife, uh, the suburban housewife of the 1950s, unless she was unusually creative, didn't have much to do. It was kind of boring and uh, easy target for Betty Friedan's next start. Again, she was right to focus on that problem, on the problem of the dysfunctional, non-functional um, American home. Mm -hmm. um, but she came across and said, well, there's only one way to, to get out of that. And that is to uh, women have to get into the labor force. I mean, to put it in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Women must go into the labor force. They got to go to work. Their children should go to daycare centers. Uh, uh, well, the whole the whole paraphernalia uh, of of the feminist uh, political cultural agenda. Now there was there were other options. We maybe come back to those later on, but uh, but it had a huge effect because also once you move into the labor force, pregnancy becomes a real problem. Um, it is true. Pregnancy for the suburban housewife was not a big problem. She had plenty of time in her hands and she had a nice place to, to wait to have the baby and so on. But uh, once you're working, once you're employed, pregnancy is a problem. Uh, and uh, the unintended pregnancy is a real problem. And abortion became a solution. Um, uh, the, I mean, it, it was, it was uh, very clear that as the feminist revolution moved through uh, American life, as the uh, homemaker model started to disintegrate and fall apart, as uh, women moved uh, uh, fairly rapidly into the professions and into business and so on, abortion became kind of a necessary adjunct to, to make that system function reasonably well. Uh, again, Again, you make the relationship, well, why didn't they use birth control? Well, yeah, well, okay, the problem is birth control doesn't always work. Or mistake, quote, unquote, mistakes happen, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the birth control's failures or its inadequacies lead to the demand for abortion. Again, I think the relationship between the two, the two issues. Uh, the other thing that happened, the pop, and I, I don't think this can be underestimated, the fear of global overpopulation, mm -hmm. which began to swell up in the 1950s. Um, it, was, it is true that the world's population was growing rapidly. Why? Well, it wasn't birth control, it was death control. Uh, uh, the introduction of, uh, of DDT, which wiped out mosquitoes in the third world, uh, brought a huge decline in the number of people dying of malaria, just to choose one example. 
uh, a, a better food supply uh, and improved uh, ways of moving food around the world. Famines had always killed lots of people. Suddenly the world became famine proof uh, and people didn't die of hunger. Anymore. So populations were growing, not for bad reasons, but for good reasons. Kind of a health explosion was taking place. And, uh, uh, but that's not how people came to see it. Uh, in the United States, uh, again, several, it's interesting again, how rich people who had supported say the Comstocks in the 19th century, now the wealthy people began to worry about population growth. Okay. Families were too large. The Rockefeller family, mm -hmm. most prominently, uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller, the, uh, the third launched the uh, Population Council in 1952, which was to come up with strategies to combat global population growth. And uh, pretty soon pastors, missionaries, medical doctors also began to get very fearful about what was happening, particularly in the third world, but also they didn't like the American baby boom. They had to be, and baby booms in some other Western countries, such as Australia, had to be put an end to. Uh, so again, those factors, again, if you can't, if you can't prevent it through birth control, well, there's always abortion as well. So it's interesting that I, 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 uh, I, I bought this book, The Population Paul Bomb. Ehrlich's, yep, Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb. Yeah. Huge influence on my generation. I was in college in the late 60s, early 70s, in the university. You can't, that, that book had a huge influence, a huge influence. Now, the, the interesting thing is he, he actually, he actually makes a reference to, to the, to this book by, uh, by Lawrence Ladder. He, he's got it on his, uh, on the reading list, the recommended reading list. And, uh, and you're right to emphasize the latter book. That's, that was an important book, an important book to, in a sense, tear down the arguments against abortion and come up with a whole set of new arguments in, in its favor. And, and then, and then I, I discovered just last week that actually, uh, that afterwards, Ladder himself, the guy who wrote the, the abortion book, he actually brought out a book uh, called, uh, you see it here, uh, Breeding Ourselves to Death, 1971. <laughs> and he, it's, it's interesting, it's got all these, uh, it's got like all these ads from the New York Times from that from that <laughs> time, like babies yeah, as yeah. a threat to peace. You know, it, that's kind of the the vibe in this in this book. Yeah. Very much so, and it was uh, the propaganda against children, against babies, against large families became intense, and and like I said, my generation. Uh, and I was I was born as part of the baby boom. I was born in 1949, right in the middle of the baby boom after the war. Uh, our generation was huge, and we were supposed to have our own baby boom, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, our generation, my generation, by and large, uh, bought into the arguments in those books. And again, the Ehrlich the Ehrlich book had a huge influence, um, and the propaganda was intense. You showed the the, the uh, the ads in the New York Times, that was just very, very common. And uh, unfortunately, the church has bought into the same arguments as well. Okay. Um, now, maybe, would you, would you consider that the whole population issue, was that, um, was that like, a, was that like a movement or, or was that more kind of people with money trying to move something in the country? I mean, the feminist movement, that was kind of like a movement. Uh, but you know, the, the population issue, was that more kind of something that, that got pushed onto the people or? Well, uh, we, people were frightened. Uh, again, there was a concerted effort, uh, uh but a well-organized effort. What is true is that there it was a well-organized effort to, uh, to, to turn Americans from being pro-natalists and pro-child and pro-family to becoming anti-natalists, anti-child. Mm -hmm. It was organized. Again, the Population Council was one of the first groups. A number of other groups came along as well. <clears throat> uh, money, money came from again some from a number of wealthy, rich Americans. 
Mm -hmm. foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, um, and a deliberate effort at propaganda was there without question. Uh, public relations consultants were called in, uh, ad, ad, advertise, ad men were called in to do the kind of ad you just showed. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a concerted effort to change American views and particularly to scare young people out of, out of, uh, out of, out of having babies. And so while the American marriage boom continued into the early 1970s, uh, the uh, still as late as well, the year I was married, 1972, the average age, average age for first marriage for a woman was still under 21, still about 20. That's the average. So a lot of marriages at 18 and 19, uh, a lot. Uh, and the average age for a man to get married, a little higher, was like 22 or 23. But I mean, young people were still getting married. But by the time my wife and I got married, the standard line well, we're going to get married, but we're not going to have children. Okay. Uh, and uh, so marriage continued, the marriage boom continued a little longer. The American birth rate began to tumble in 1964. Again, when the, when the first signs of this propaganda regime were, were finally kicking in mm -hmm. full bore. Um, so again, I, you cannot underestimate the population scare as a... Uh, is a factor driving the push for abortion. Uh, again, it was life or death. Um, the babies will kill us. Uh, you yeah. saw that ad. Yeah. And the babies will kill us. So, well, we're going to have to kill the babies. <coughs> I mean, that's that, that's that's the logic. The babies. And if we do it in utero, well, maybe they're not really fully human anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so that issue of what 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 is the nature of the, 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 the hard part for um, um, uh, for the pro abortion cause was at that very time uh, some very beautiful pictures. Remember, the photographer's name was Nilsson. He came out of Sweden. I don't know if you've ever seen his books, but he started doing books on fetal photos of fetal, of fetal life. Uh, and astonishing how he got these pictures that I still don't entirely know. Some were. Uh, of, 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 fetal, of, of fetuses still inside their mother. Some were fetuses that were still born or some maybe. But anyway, of gorgeous pictures of, 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 of the fetus, of the human, of the human, small human preborn child, uh, which denied any argument that you could make that these are not human beings. Are, uh, that was coming out at the same time. So the... All that meant is that the propaganda had to be ramped up even more to deny the very thing you can see before your eyes. Mm -hmm. And and then I also discovered that there were pastors and theologians kind of buying into these narratives and that there was even a kind of like a network of uh, pastors that that uh, started uh, promoting or facilitating uh, abortions. Exactly. Well, it goes back. It goes back to a to a dark, a dark story uh, in American Christian history. Uh, it goes back to the 1920s and 1930s, actually. Um, and again, the character, the figure, the great American birth control proponent, Margaret Sanger, mm -hmm. uh, was 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 key to this. Uh, she was. Uh, <laughs> There's great irony in this Anthony Comstock, who I mentioned, the architect of the American anti-birth control and anti-abortion laws in many respects, certainly their enforcement. Um, his last effort right before he died was to put Margaret Sanger in prison. Um, she got away. She had a fake passport and she, she fled to England and she went over to England and had, <laughs> had an affair with Havelock Ellis, the first so-called great sexologist. Yes. But anyway, yes. Comstock died. Uh, she, she came back. Um, and uh, during and after World War I, she came to prominence. Uh, she was a eugenicist. Now, eugenics is the so-called the science or the pseudoscience of controlled human breeding um, and uh, 
is one of her favorite phrases early on, she dropped this language a little later, is that what we need to do to control, is use birth control to create a race of thoroughbreds. Uh, by that she meant human thoroughbreds. So the idea was to encourage fertility among the favored, among the gifted, among, among well, basically at that point, among the rich uh, and powerful, and to discourage it among everybody else. Uh, and she particularly did not like Roman Catholics. Uh, and uh, she, partly because the Roman Catholic churches was one, one church that did not uh, change their views on birth control and abortion during this time, in fact, strengthened them in some ways. Uh, so she hated Roman Catholics for that. But she also, she was a eugenicist and a racist. There's a, no, absolutely no question about it. And she promoted her the Birth Control League, all but merged with the American Eugenics Society uh, in the 1920s. And the major project of the American Eugenics Society was their outreach to Christian clergy. Uh, 80% of their budget went to support a committee to encourage eugenics thinking among Protestant pastors. And, and now this played into uh, a theological uh, issue among, well, among Christians. It's always been there, but it became much more exaggerated at this time as how will the, how will the kingdom of God come? Uh, the pessimists, uh, called premillennialists, believe that human beings were awash in sin and were a kind of a mess, and whenever they tried to fix the world up, things got worse. Someday, Jesus was going to return and just set everything right, but it was only after we've really messed things up. The world was a completely massive disaster. Now, the postmillennialists uh, were the ones who believed that, no, 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 no. Human beings can make the world good and beautiful and correct. And one of these days, yeah, we'll do everything right. We'll finally get it right. We'll build a, the kingdom of God on earth. And it's going to be really great. And Jesus will come down at the second coming and say, boy, you guys did well. My good and faithful servants, I'm here now to reign. Thank you for all your good work. Uh, I mean, it's simplified. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean to underestimate the huge theological implications there, but that's but the post-millennialists, the ones who believe that human beings could make the world a beautiful, wonderful place, easily became a genesis. Uh, that Jesus wants us to, uh, to control or prevent the birth uh, of babies to, oh, diseased, undesirable types, uh, low, low intellect types, people from primitive cultures, they shouldn't be allowed to breed. Uh, Jesus wants us to only have lovely, beautiful, wonderful people. Uh, people that always, of course, it was people that looked like me, people that looked like me uh, uh, to breed. Uh, it's so astonishing. There were, <laughs> at this time in the 30s, 20s, and 30s, there were the American Eugenic Society had a contest, an annual contest for the best eugenics sermon. Um, and you, you read these sermons, you just you just you just kind of want to fall over. Uh, you can't believe it. But it was things like Jesus was the ultimate eugenicist. Um, uh, we have to uh, correct. They they would go so far as to say, in order to, to make the world a beautiful place for the kingdom of God to flourish, the undesirables are going to have to be sterilized against their choice or put in camps. Uh, we'll put them in camps where they can be isolated. And uh, cannot. Uh, this, I mean, it's pretty weird stuff. This is not from Nazis. This is from Christian theologians in the United States uh, thinking about how to make the kingdom of God on earth. So it's pretty awful. Awesome. So all of this was in the background to um, the push for a, a birth control and abortion after World War II. Now, the more extreme eugenics arguments were dropped by and large, those were discredited by the Nazi experience during World War II. But uh, they were uh, uh, still had kind of what I call kind of a soft eugenics. And you can see it even in the work of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. 
which had been called the Birth Control League. They changed their name in 1944, very clever move. Move, and actually became more conservative in some respects. Uh, uh, Margaret Sanger was kicked out of the organization. She was too extreme. The, the new view was that Planned Parenthood meant child spacing. You have a big family, you have five, six children, that'd be great, but they should be properly spaced. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, again, just looking at the ads, there was kind of a soft eugenics here, uh, not extreme and so on. But the Christian books of that time uh, began to buy, particularly those that were buying into the birth control argument, were buying into the same sort of soft eugenics mood. Uh, when the Christians began to turn towards abortion, it came as a result, actually it came, tended to come from two groups. Um, medical doctors, who were Christian medical doctors who were, and who were missionaries in the third world and also missionaries in the third world. It's pretty striking, the early consultations um, uh, where the uh, forbidden subjects, not just of birth control, but of abortion were coming up tended to be organized by Christian missionaries who were shocked, shocked by the family sizes they saw in places like Africa and Asia mm -hmm. and said something has got to be done. This, this is where the global overpopulation problem is most real and most pressing. And uh, the, uh, again, you saw it, Policy changes began to take place in the 50s, again, among some of the mainline churches. Uh, even, the, even the conservative Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, which is the old German, German Lutheran stock in America, but the conservative Germans, um, uh, accepted, uh, accepted birth control and starting in the late, early 19 and mid 1950s. And we're getting soft on abortion, again, under the influence of one of their key theologians. Um, but it was in the 60s that these forces converged. Again, feminism uh, was having an effect on the churches for the first time. Some churches were looking at ordaining women. They'd never done that before. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And again, it was a logical consequence of the feminist argument. Uh, the uh, uh, population explosion in, in the third world in particular uh, was a great concern. Also, a secondary concern was the continued high fertility in the United States, although that was already falling. Um, and uh, I, I think the arguments that, it's, it's even again chilling to see evangelical writers, conservative evangelical writers begin to look at the fetus and say, well, we're not too sure about the humanity of the fetus. Show me where in the New Testament it says that the fetus is a uh, is uh, is a human being. Well, then you point well, John jumping in the womb of yes, Elizabeth, yes. what about something like that? Well, and they misunderstood that. You know, there's always ways to worm your way around a biblical text that you don't like. Um, and you have to throw out a good, a whole lot of passages in the Old Testament too. But well, that's the Old Testament. That's not the gospel. And so they started worming their way around and denying, quite openly and quite directly, that that the fetus was uh, that the fetus was uh, human. Um, and again, these are these are including even by this is by the late 1960s. Uh, there was a gathering organized by the National Association of Evangelicals, uh, which is the, well, better, best known, uh, that was Billy Graham's movement. This was sort of the intellectual arm of the Billy Graham mm -hmm. evangelistic mm -hmm. movement. But these were true, good old, true American evangelicals. If that term means anything, this is who they were. And these were the seminary presidents and also the heads of their medical societies and the, um, the missionaries uh, who came together in 1968 at a gathering where quite astonishing, they, they said in 1968, this was five years before Rome, the Bible does not expressly prohibit either contraception or abortion. And of course, they would take that and say, well, if the Bible doesn't prohibit it, then Christians are free using under Christian liberty to do both. 
uh, if they have good cause. Um, they called for, in fact, they, 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 they cited the necessity and permissibility for abortion uh, need to be legalized and allowed to happen. Uh, and, and again, they called for changes in state laws to allow abortion. And these are the conservative evangelicals. Well, we're not talking hardcore left-wing Christians here. Um, there were some of those too. They had long ago had jumped on the abortion bandwagon, or at least earlier. But now the conservative evangelicals were doing it too. Again, I think the spirit of the times in recognition of the population explosion, particularly was taking place in the wrong places, um, the uh, feminist movement and uh, uh, the arguments you talk about in the books of, uh, of trying to re look at abortion in a different way is, uh, is in some ways a defense of the earth against human uh, against human reading, over reading, and so on. All of that converged together, and evangelical Christians were part of it. But but not. <laughs> The moods change. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I've, I've got this book. It's. I think this this was the. You know the symposium uh, where they came together. This is from. Sixty nine, and it's a, it's probably gone. is the top, there's several titles to the book, but yeah, that's yeah. probably the one. The affirmations Birth control are... and, the, and the Christian. Yeah, so, that's it. That's it. That's the book. It's it's kind of a, astonishing to to hear the stories, knowing that the evangelicals are really uh, very solidly on the pro life side of the issue nowadays. So the question would be, what happens? Well, you know, just just for example, just out of that book, I've, I've jotted down a couple of things here. Uh, Bruce Waltke, who's one of the uh, prominent theologians, has an essay in there where he says God does not regard the fetus as a soul. I mean, statements are are like that are in there, uh, and it's a uh, uh, prominent professor at Fuller University. Fetus does not partake of the divine image. Uh, again, these are evangelicals. Doing that. So yeah, you're right though. Something changed. I've as a historian, I've tried to explain to students um, what happened in the late 1960s in the United States, but also in Europe. You had the 68ers and so on. Europe went through the same thing. Yes. Just about every uh, other other out, other outposts of Western civilization, such as Australia and so on. Same thing happened. How, what happened? They said the 68 to 69. Why didn't everybody seem to go start raving crazy or certainly anti Christian uh, to, to the point of throwing out about 2,000 years of Christian social teaching and, and cultural understanding? What happened? Now, historians, secular historians, are not allowed to say the devil did it or Mm -hmm. uh, Satan and his wily ways got worked away through. You can't come up with explanations like that. The only one that I could come up with is that space aliens came and dropped poison gas in the atmosphere. <laughs> Everybody went crazy for about two years. Uh, uh, it's a secular argument. But, but it's, but, it's uh, doesn't it, isn't uh, it kind of a, a, sort of a good thing to see that we are constantly kind of it doesn't need much that we just kind of go with the times, you know. Uh, it, it's kind of when when there's something in the air, you know. You kind of uh, you, you. It's difficult to resist, you know. If you don't have a certain, I don't know, a stamina, a certain roots, you know, uh, faith roots, and well, you know, there's stories. Uh, in fact, the, the Old Testament is replete with stories about what happened to the Hebrew people. Yes. Time and again, they get things right. They're right with God. Uh, they're doing all the things they're supposed to do, and things are going well. <laughs> yeah. And then, then they oh, become complacent. Uh, they start chasing after golden calves and, uh, and other gods. And, um, 
and they start, you know, well, it's really hard to follow these structures on sex and marriage. That's, they're not all that important. We just fool around a little bit on the side and, and pretty soon everything falls apart. <laughs> the kingdom is ruined. Yep. They're enslaved yep. by somebody somewhere. And, <laughs> it's, 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 and then a new set of prophets come along. Right, yeah. and set things right, but it takes maybe a century or so to get things right again. Yeah, so hey, this is a story of uh, that. It's just a biblical story. It's been told, mm -hmm. told many times. What happened was uh, several figures came along um, in uh, in in the evangelical world. Uh, there, in fact, there was a Swiss connection here too. This is where Switzerland comes yes. in. Um, uh, one of the figures was Francis Schaeffer, an American-born mm -hmm. pastor, reformed pastor, but an evangelical reformed pastor, who uh, went to Switzerland, I think 1948, if I remember correctly, he and his wife, and set up a community up in the mountains there, La Brie, kind of a, a shelter, a place for Christian, Christian young people to come and spend some time in the community. Um, that ran, well, it still runs, I gather. It's still there today. I mean, he, he, he passed away some decades ago. But he was a key figure in this. Um, some of his students were. Um, one man who actually was a personal friend and colleague of mine, I think actually in some ways was the key historical figure, was a man named Harold, Harold L.J. Brown. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he spent time in Switzerland. He had uh, studied there. He, he, many number of times, he went and uh, spent months, periods of time in Lombri. Uh For a while, he was, after being ordained, uh, went back to Switzerland and had a parish in the Swiss mountains for a while. He, um, uh, his story is it's a pretty interesting one. He was uh, raised, born and raised a, a Roman Catholic. Not a strong, well, a strong, well, I shouldn't say. He was born and raised Roman Catholic, went to a Jesuit high school in the United States. Uh, won a scholarship to Harvard, a preeminent American university. But while at Harvard, uh, reading uh, Martin Luther, of all things, uh, he got interested in Martin Luther and uh, converted, uh, went from Catholicism into uh, evangelicalism, originally Lutheranism, but he eventually wound up what you'd call a classic American evangelical. Um, got a series of degrees, including a theology degree at Harvard. Uh, <clears throat> became a, began, to, began to write books, but key, the key thing here is he became an editor, a young associate editor of uh, Christianity Today, which is the primary American evangelical magazine. Uh, Founded in the mid 1950s, Billy Graham and his group were behind it. And uh, Joe Brown came there. Uh, he came there after uh, the affirmations, this book you showed, uh, which had been pro birth control, pro abortion, even pro pro sterilization. It, it was a, it covered all the all the stops there pretty much. He came there and was asked as a young assistant editor to write the editorial for CT on Roe v. Wade. And he wrote a strong anti-Roe editorial. He went back, uh, went back and said, you know, what's happened here is not just a, a legal change, but it's a huge cultural shift. The rejection of 2000 years of Christian teaching um, on the matter. It's a strong, strong statement. And in, and that was striking and stunning because at the same time, when Roe had come out, again, reflecting this earlier evangelical quasi-acceptance of abortion, a number of prominent evangelicals praised Roe v. Wade. Uh, pastor, last name of Criswell, who, who ran an evangelical Southern Baptist, had one of the largest churches in the country, one of these mega churches with 30,000 members and so on. He, he praised Roe v. Wade for, he put it a blow for Christian liberty because it was, he saw, he saw the Catholics, again, reflecting Margaret Sanger's old view, the Catholics were the problem. Uh, Catholics were suppressing Protestant freedom. Uh, 
which of course is a complete lie historically. Uh, the American anti-birth control and anti-abortion laws were strictly Protestant in their origin and passage, but <clears throat> nonetheless, Margaret Sanger turned that argument around very effectively. And Chriswell and other prominent evangelicals welcomed the Roe decision. But then Joe Brown's editorial uh, turned the tide, it really did. Um, and I guess there were a lot of internal controversy at the magazine, but it did turn the tide. And I, he. I, 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 actually, I actually read, read that editorial, and there's uh, no name underneath. It got published without without the name of Joe Brown on it. So well, it's a, I, it, was, I, it was an editorial. It was an editorial, you're right. I, I, I always asked myself, why is it just if that, there was a reason, you know, or? Well, you would do that because as an editorial, it means it reflects the considered opinion of the magazine as a whole. Okay. And just like an editorial at a prominent newspaper at the New York mm -hmm. Times, they're not signed. Yeah. It's what the editors have decided. Mm -hmm. And so what Joe did is he convinced the other editors to sign off on that statement. In a sense, pulled them out of the fog that they had gone into. I, I, and, I asked myself, you know, my, my impression is I, I, I also saw that uh, Brown wrote a big book about uh, heresies in the 80s precisely and he, he seems to have yes. been a guy who who was really uh bright and he kind of knew history you know which would be a compliment for you also but there, there there was something there in his senses that you know he was already awake and and roe versus wade made an activist out of him because he, he kind of saw it and where all the other guys didn't see it <laughs> I, I, like I say, I became uh, not just a friend of his, but a co colleague. We, we worked together under the same umbrella for almost 20 years. He edited, I published the magazine, or a, a publication called Religion and Society Report, and he was the editor. So, I mean, we worked closely together on that project for nearly 20 years. He was very bright. He had a good, deep sense of history. Um, he was, I think to some degree, I'm just guessing, Mm -hmm. I really never asked him this. I should. I wish I had. Um, I think he's with us still. Um, but I think his Catholic background helped him. Okay. Um, and helped him avoid the worst aspects of the evangelical fog that had come in and had, I think, corrupted evangelical thinking. Um, he still had some grounding. It, 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 trained by the Jesuits, had some grounding in the concept of natural law. And, and the richer, and the, and to be honest, a richer understanding of, uh, of I think, some of, the, some of the issues involved. Again, one of the reasons, another you know, a document which came out also in 68, when the evangelicals were throwing themselves behind birth control and abortion and sterilization, uh, the Roman Catholic Church in 1968 shocked everyone when Paul VI issued Humana Vitae, uh, reaffirming Catholic teaching on birth control. No one expected that. Uh, uh, it was a shock because all the signs pointed to the Catholic Church also caving in at the time to the spirit of the time, and they didn't. And uh, <clears throat> he had every reason to cave in. He was under tremendous pressure to do so. All the sick, but didn't. So I, I sometimes think that the the uh, the the, uh, the Catholic example may have helped Joel keep his I think uh, keep a clearer clearer mind on this question. I I uh, just to guess. He also wrote a book about uh, in the late sixties called um, a Protest of a. Troubled Protestant, I think it was called. And that book got translated into German, actually. And it got put out uh, in the, in a, uh, it got published in a, you know, the bookstore branch of actually my denomination. So there's, there's kind of a connection there and the link. That's why I find it very uh, interesting. And I'm trying to follow, in, to follow it up, you know, and, and see if I can find this, uh, the missing, uh, 
links, but I found it interesting because, yeah, it's Kirche im Ausverkauf. Uh, they they named it in in German, the protest of a of a uh, worried Protestant, and so that that kind of gave me the impression that you know uh, he kind of talks about the uh, ecumenical movement and syncretism and kind of lo- all these issues, and I just felt he that guy was really bright, you know, and awake, and he he saw. He saw things that uh, other people weren't seeing uh, already in the late sixties. So, so he had these sensibilities, and so I, I really no, liked. He had a, <laughs> no, I, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. He was he was very much on top of the big picture when many other people were caving in to the spirit of the times and going with the flow, as we say. Mm-hmm. One other thing I should say about him for 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 your Swiss audience, he was also his time in Switzerland had affected him in another way. He became a, a very good great skier, downhill okay. skier, but also a mountaineer. He did mountain climbing. Okay. Did all the I think did most of the peaks in Switzerland, but also the United States. So he was he was one of you. He was one of you. <laughs> in that way. I, will, I will try to find out a bit more about him and uh I'll give you updates as I make discoveries. <laughs> um, so there was another man called Everett Koop, who I think was quite important uh, and bringing out a book with uh, Francis Schaeffer. Yes, precisely. And, and, and uh, yes, he was a medical doctor, uh, became Surgeon General of the United States with, under Ronald Reagan in 1982. Um, in that book with Schaefer, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, it was a film series, quite a good film series, and uh, still well worth read- or watching. And the book is well worth reading. But yes, trying to understand how the culture, the civilization, and Christians were turning against uh, the humanity of the unborn. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful book. And he had a, he had a, they had a huge influence. So yeah, Harold O.J. Brown, C. Everett Koop, Francis Schaeffer uh, pulled evangelicals back from the uh, pro-abortion uh, cause. It, it kind of shows uh, that one or two or three persons together can make a, have a great impact. And uh, it's kind of encouraging stories for me to just see it from the moment that Larry Ladder wrote his book to the Roe versus Wade decision was seven years. And then from Roe versus Wade until Ronald Reagan became president and and uh, and had a like a, an evangelical uh, uh, Everett Koop um, as family minister and bringing out a book, pro-life book. It was also seven years. So it was, you know, it was 66 to 73 and 73 to 80. So it was like two big revolutions uh, within 14 years. That's my impression. I'm glad to see you had that, I'm glad to see you had that book by Ronald Reagan. Uh, this is yeah. my copy. I guess he's just got yeah. the cover. Uh, let me tell you a story about this book. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Abortion uh, and the Conscience of the Nation. And many people are surprised to learn that Reagan, Ronald Reagan wrote a book about abortion, basically calling for the overturn of the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, but that book had a, has, has an interesting history. Uh, Ronald, this came out in 1984. It was the uh, last year of his first presidential term. Mm-hmm. Um, he would win a landslide election later that year. <clears throat> but Ronald Reagan's, I would say, his associates, the people who controlled him in the White House, mm-hmm. his chief of staff and other people who control access to the president and so on, you, you think the president is powerful, the most powerful man in the world. He's got, you can do this, do that. It's not how it works. Uh, his handlers, so to speak, uh, his chief of staff and uh, his chief press officer and so on, did not want uh, abortion to be a major issue. Yes. So they really yes. wanted to keep Reagan out of the issue and did not want to have it happen. Certainly would not countenance and support him producing a book. So how did this book appear? Um, it was actually put together a, a, a draft, or at least a working draft of the book. It was put together by a man named J.P. James McFadden, who was a conservative, was a publisher, National Review of the magazine, but also was the founder of a, of a journal called Human Life Review. 
uh, which began to appear in 1975 uh, and in some ways still continues today, was a, um, it was a quarterly, just an excellent pro-life magazine, which was compiled, um, not a, a journal, published as a journal, and pulling together articles uh, uh, on the abortion question, good articles, uh, pro-life articles. But McFadden wrote, drafted this, and to get to get it to Reagan, they just couldn't do it using normal channels. So they had a, a a woman, a Christian woman, uh, probably I'm sure she was Roman Catholic, Jim, Jim McFadden was, who was a secretary in the White House who had ac access to the presidential office. The, 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 uh, um, and she she could get in there at any time. She she was a typist and so on. Um, very few people had that access. So anyway, she stayed late one night. She had a copy of the draft. She stayed late one night. Everybody else had gone home, including the people, the, the guardians and the gatekeepers. She snuck the manuscript in so that Ronald Reagan would receive it the next morning without anybody knowing. And uh, and he was in on this. He agreed to do this, and he got it, and he went through the draft, he you know, made his changes and this, that, and when I bought, signed off on it, yes, this is now my, now my essay. Uh, mm -hmm. And then she snuck it back out. Uh, and, <laughs> and so what appears without any of Reagan's associates knowing it's going to be coming out. Uh, that's kind of how sometimes politics works. It's uh, you know, being all powerful, you're not really all powerful. You've got, you've got to work so, around the system. So if we're if we're talking about uh, uh, President Reagan, would you say he was a, you know, was he a, was his pro-life stance opportunistic or was it like honest? Because I I read somewhere in the '60s he kind of promoted a more liberal stance uh, when he was governor in uh, in California. So what what's your feel? I mean, you you know. President Reagan quite well, or you knew, you knew him quite well. What would you say? Was no, it genuine? In the 1960s, he was following the flow, and he he supported uh, a liberalization of the California abortion law. But he also was signed in, into law the first uh, no fault divorce law in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Again, he was a Republican, but he thought. At that time, the Republican Party had not yet become pro-life and pro-family. It was pro-business. It was a pro-business party. And uh, and to the degree that feminism existed, it was it had a home in the Republican Party, not the Democrats. All that reversed in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, but uh, Reagan, and to be frank, <laughs> You didn't have much support if you were writing against abortion in the 1960s. There wasn't much coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church was embroiled in Vatican II and its great council, and things were getting strange and difficult there. The Catholic Church had kind of pulled out of a lot of these questions. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And as we've talked about before, the evangelical churches, the Protestant churches were shifting their views, or appeared they were. Um, the support to uh, liberalized abortion and easy divorce in the 1960s just seemed like the normal right thing to do. No one was, no one was really fighting them. But Reagan did change. I, 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 it was a genuine and conver deep conversion to become pro-life and pro-family. Um, he, uh, uh, he was not a. I want to say he's not a, he was not a simple man, but he was a direct man. He was not a liar. Uh, he was always a direct man. He was honest. Uh, and he was quite clear on his beliefs. Uh, he became pro-life and pro-family before most of the Republican Party. That'd be the best way to put it, too. Most of the Republican Party said, well, what's we're concerned about what's going on in the Defense Department, and national security, and they were concerned about business. That was pretty much it. Reagan changed. The, one of the reasons he had to sneak the pro-life book in and out is because it didn't fit into the agenda of the people running the party. No, no, he was a genuine, I, you know, I, I was in the Reagan administration um, at the end, um, but in a telling way, I, in 1988, the U.S. Congress created a freestanding 
commission called the National Commission on Children, which was designed to look at the status of children in the United States. And Ronald Reagan was allowed to, to choose 12 members of that commission. Um, and there, there were another 24 came from other appointees. But anyway, I was one of the 12 appointees that he had. And he, he was a no, he, uh, I, I met him then and I met him another time as well. He said his, his, his conversion was genuine. Uh, he was up against uh, a political situation which was not friendly at that time to pro-family and pro-life work. Yeah. But does he converse? And could he have done more? Possibly. But anyway, yeah, I think he did quite a bit. He certainly, whenever he had the chance, said and did the right thing. Mm -hmm. That's uh, really nice to hear. That was that was also my in impression uh, during my preparations that there was a, a genuine uh, a genuine change of heart and change of mind that Reagan had. And uh, the the weird thing is because when you talk about Reagan and abortion, people will come and and bring the sixties and they will say, oh well, he was just you know, he was just opportunistic, you know, trying to make profit. It was just a political decision and. Uh, that's what one what one hears quite often when one talks about the abortion issue. That it, the abortion issue was kind of like a, um, more kind of like a political de decision by people on the right who thought they can uh, they can uh, they can bring in the evangelicals uh, by uh, taking taking on the abortion issue. Um, what do you think about those ideas? Well, again, yeah, I think he, um, he, he his his conversion was genuine. Is genuine. Uh, he again faced a party apparatus that was not ready for that, and I think that's sort of the common theme of all that we've talked about so far. Is things were really in flux in the late '60s and early '70s, and it wasn't clear how it was all going to turn out. You talked about the influence of individuals in making history. Mm -hmm. I think we see dramatic cases. Again, uh, looking at the Roman Catholic Church, Paul VI had every reason to throw in the towel mm -hmm. uh, and accept some form of artificial contraception, uh, just like everybody else was doing. It would have made his life a whole lot easier. Uh, the only thing going against it was <laughs> the whole of the Christian tradition <laughs> and <laughs> the Catholic teachings on uh, on the nature on the, on, on the nature of human life, and the, 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 the real meaning of the fetus, um, but he had the courage. He had the courage to uh, to stand firm. And again, we see again among evangelicals like us in America stirring towards uh, like abandonment of the Christian tradition, uh, not just on birth control, but specifically here on the abortion question. And uh, many prominent evangelicals, I mean, when the Supreme Court looked at the world in 1972, 1973, th throwing out the uh, abortion law, I said, well, this is what the Christians want. And they would have <laughs> mm -hmm. been hard pressed to find prominent Christian voices to support the existing system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or at least I, I, Catholic, Catholics have not changed on abortion, but um, the Catholics were in turmoil. Uh, and but the, among among Protestants, it was would have been hard to find clear, consistent anti-abortion thinking. There was a little bit of it, but not much. So everything was in flux. And again, what pulled the evangelicals back again? I I, I think to some degree the the, the, the fog lifted, but. Uh, Biblically based figures such as Joe Brown, such as Sierra Coop, such as Francis Schaeffer, did pull the evangelical churches back to a pro life position. Mm -hmm. I, I, they had not been there. Would it have happened? I don't know. Certainly not in the same way and not as forcefully. Mm -hmm. um, people can make a difference, uh, and uh, they can they they can uh, they can find the opportunities to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So may, may, maybe to kind of uh, bring things together a bit at the end of our uh, podcast, um, 
Now uh, it's 50 years ago, Roe versus Wade, and we've got a strong pro-life movement that's built up over the decades. Uh, I, I would say probably also on the pro-life side, there's been mistakes made. Um, what would your view be of, uh, of the pro-life movement and the pro-life side looking back at the last, you know, 20, 30, 40 years? And do you have some type of a recommendation for the pro-life movement, how they should and could move forward and what what you think is very important talking about this very personal issue of abortion of abortion well the most important thing is that there, there was not a pro-life movement in 1973 um uh, when, when, when again when when roe was issued you would have been hard pressed to find any organized opposition mm -hmm. uh, the churches had failed i think very broadly uh, Protestant and even Catholics. Catholics got pushed off on other issues and were not, not paying much attention. Uh, so I'm putting together a movement, uh, not just an astonishing movement, because it's lasted close to 50 years now. And it's, it's powerful. Uh, <clears throat> the annual pro-life march uh, on the anniversary of the Roe decision, January of each year in Washington, D.C., has to be seen to be believed. The, the mainstream media treats it like, oh, a couple hundred people got together and had a, had a march. It's no, a couple hundred thousand people got together on a cold winter day to march in defense of life. And if you go and see it, it's astonishing the kaleidoscope of people, religious movements, and the astonishing number of young people that are there. I mean, it's, it really is. Uh, it's, a, it's a young people's march. And, and Hundreds of thousands are there every year. That has happened every year. It's uh, quite a moving thing to see. And uh, nothing like that has happened in American political history. That's that sustained kind of responsible protest against a political decision that's now dec many decades old. That's never happened before, not at least on that level. Uh, wait, well, what were mistakes made? The problem was ever since Roe, the 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 game the game has been rigged in favor of the pro-abortion clause. Um, the uh, Supreme Court has not allowed democracy to operate here, and that's what's one of the reasons things where Roe is breaking down now is not the American the genius of the original American system is that issues such as abortion or birth control, or marriage. Uh, what is the nature of marriage? Were to be left to the states. That was, this was not uh, something that the central federal government would deal with, except in limited, a few limited cases of federal territories, the District of Columbia. But outside of that, these were state issues, which was right, because it meant that a much more localized government uh, would have to sort the things out listen to the ethical, moral, practical arguments, and come up with a, a political uh, compromise. Uh, not perfect, never perfect. Uh, what, what the Supreme Court did is just put an end to that uh, and allowed almost nothing to happen except what they said. And that's still true to this day. Uh, the rationale shifted a little bit to this day. Democracy has not been allowed to function. It's the same problem that, that the, the Europeans have. Uh, the original European Union was not supposed to have competence on matters of sex, marriage, and family. Uh, those were left to the member states. Well, how's that going? Not so well. well. No, not so well. <laughs> it's exactly the same problem. Uh, and it's also creating huge divisions in the, in the European Union. Uh, but uh, so it's the same, it's the very same development. What the astonishing thing now is that and the, this, the strategy of using, trying to finally get a majority in the Supreme Court to overturn the decision actually may happen. I, I have to say, I was always skeptical um, that it would ever pull, pull it off, that the Supreme Court would always, and we've been disappointed before. People were appointed to the court who were supposed to be pro-life uh, and then they weren't. Uh, mm -hmm. They had a chance with the Casey decision in the early 90s. And it was every hope that 
uh, some recent appointees would make a difference, and they didn't. Uh, so we've been disappointed many times before, but it, it's very, I have to say, I'm a pessimist on these matters by nature, but it's very likely that this time will be different. Um, so I think the, the pro-life, the other thing we haven't talked about, and again, uh, our, the figures of C. Everett Coop and Harold L. J. Brown are key here. The pro-life movement sparked a massive movement uh, creating pregnancy care centers for mm -hmm. uh, every every American city of any significant size as a pregnancy care uh, care center in it to provide support for women uh, to carry a child to, to term um, in a difficult pregnancy. It was the Christian Action Council, the original group, and that was co-founded by Coop and Harold Brown. Um, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't know the total number they have. My guess would be that certainly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such of such organizations. And uh, I've seen the uh, access to abortion has been dramatically declining. The city I live near Rockford, where I'm speaking from Rockford, Illinois. We had an abortion clinic care, abortion center. Uh, every day, every day of every every year for years, uh, pro-life people would gather outside the center for peaceful protest. Uh, there was never a day that didn't happen. Uh, usually at least a dozen, sometimes many more, for just to, for prayer. Eventually the place shut down. Uh, they uh, just to, to, couldn't handle it anymore, and they, they shut down uh, on their own accord. Something, some, something is, you know, is coming to a head now. And I think this pro-life movement has done almost as well as it could do, given that all the legal force and legal power was on the other side. It has finally pushed the matter to front and center. Again, it's taken 50 years. That's an astonishing thing. But they developed an intellectual structure, a legal framework, league organizations that have done a good job, like the American Life League, in coming up with legal strategies to keep the issue front and center. Mm -hmm. It may pay off. Um, so I, 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 one can quibble about mistakes made along the way. I'm sure there have been many. Uh, but all looking historically, this has been an unprecedented movement. I think has done remarkably well. Well, I surely, I surely hope and pray that uh, something good will happen in the next few months. And uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Carlson, uh, for once again a very insightful talk with lots of uh, uh, details and inside information uh, from the history of the United States but also uh, about very important ethical issues uh, that are also a theme over here in Switzerland. And I hope that uh, people are going to watch this. And I just want to thank you very much. Well, happy to be with you. I've enjoyed the conversation very much. Thank you very much.